Welcome to OGL Dev. My name is Itai Meiri. In the last couple of episodes, we focused mainly on perspective projection that allows us to give the impression of uh, depth in our 3D application. So stuff that is uh, further away uh, looks smaller. And uh, today we're going to talk about the camera that enables the user to uh, move around and uh, look at the world from uh, different directions. So uh, without further ado, let's see how to do that. I'd like to start by talking about the different coordinate systems that are involved in uh, 3D graphics. When a modeling artist starts working on a new model, they would usually put the origin of the 3D coordinate system in the center and kind of uh, build the object around it. It's not mandatory, of course, but it seems to be the most uh, natural thing to do. For example, rotation around the origin is simpler than around arbitrary points. Once you've done with the model, you save it and you start from scratch on the next one. So it looks like all the objects are created in the same coordinate system, but obviously when we use them in a game, we don't render them one on, one on top of the other. Yeah, it usually doesn't make any sense. The coordinate system in which the model is created is called the local coordinate system or a local space. Some people call it the object coordinate system or object space but uh, both names mean, mean the same thing. When we talk about the position of a vertex, for example, when we load vertices into the vertex buffer, we mean the position of the vertex in the local coordinate uh, system. But the local coordinate system is just the beginning. We are usually interested in rendering a scene that contains uh, multiple objects. That scene represents the 3D world where every object is located somewhere. For example, we may have a model of a monster and we want to place uh, 10 monsters in our 3D world. So we have a single representation of the monster in its local coordinate system, but we have 10 instances of that model in different locations all around the 3D world. Therefore, the 3D world is represented by a different coordinate system, which is called the world coordinate system or uh, world space. To go from the local uh, coordinate system to the world coordinate system, we apply a world transformation. Again, some people call this a model or a object transformation. This transformation may include a combination of transformations such as scaling, if you want each monster instance to have a different size, rotation, if you want each monster to turn uh, towards a different direction, and uh, most importantly, uh, translation, because we want each monster to be positioned in a different location in the 3D world. After we apply the world transformation on all of our models, we have a set of vertices that are given in the same coordinate system, the world coordinate system. At this stage, the vertices of each monster instance will be unique when compared to the other instances of the monster. The next stage is to throw in the camera. In most cases, the camera can move around the world under some uh, limitations. For example, the camera in a flight simulator is very different than a camera in some uh, first-person shooter where your character goes on foot. But the core principle is the same. The position of the camera is dynamic and so is the direction that it is looking at. The reason that this is important is that the camera defines a view frustum. If you don't remember what a view frustum is, go back a couple of episodes to the first tutorial on perspective projection. The view frustum is attached to the camera. As the camera moves around, some objects exit the frustum and some objects enter it. We know how to render the vertices inside the frustum by projecting them on the near clip plane. But here's the problem. We designed our perspective projection in a way that the X and Y coordinates of the near clip plane will match a square that goes from uh, minus one by minus one to one by one. This is the range that the rasterizer expects. While it is possible to project vertices on any arbitrary near plane where the camera is currently located, in most such cases the projected coordinates will be outside of the valid range for the rasterizer, so they won't be rendered. We will need to apply some function that maps them to the range that can be rendered. Luckily for us, there is a simple solution to this problem. We can apply yet another transformation that will move all the objects around so that the camera will be positioned at the origin and looking down at the positive 
z-axis. Note that the objects will retain their relative position from each other as well as from the camera. So as the camera moves to the origin along with the other objects, it still sees the, the exact same world. This new transformation is called the view transformation and uh, sometimes uh, the camera transformation or the eye transformation. Accordingly, the coordinate system where the camera is at the origin looking down at the positive z-axis is called the camera coordinate system or uh, camera space, view space, eye space, you can pick your own uh, term here. At this point, we can apply the perspective projection as is and render the scene as usual. The following diagram summarizes all the transformations that are involved in 3D rendering. We start with vertices in the local coordinate system. We apply a world transformation on the vertices that moves them to their desired location in the world coordinate system. Next, we apply a view or camera transformation. This moves them along with the camera to make it appear as if the camera is located at the origin and is looking down at the positive z-axis. We call it the view coordinate system. We apply perspective projection that is made up of the perspective projection matrix. By the way, at this point, we say that the vertices are in a clip coordinate system or clip space. Next, we perform perspective division. All the vertices that can be rendered are now in the range of minus 1 to 1 on all axes. We call this the normalized device coordinates or NDC. On the normalized device coordinates, we apply the viewport transform, which translates them to window coordinates. These are now actual pixels that can be rendered on the screen. All the transformations are represented as usual by matrices and we can combine the first uh, three transformations into a single matrix called WVP for uh, world view and projection. This matrix is often called MVP, so you can use either name. We've already developed all the transformations here except the view transformation, so this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of this episode. We'll start with the math and later we'll uh, review the implementation. The target for the view transformation is to move all the objects in the world along with the camera until the camera is sitting at the origin and looking down along the positive z-axis. The camera must also be parallel to the ground, so to speak, so it, it cannot uh, tilt from, from side to side because this will break the, the rasterizer square. The view transformation is compared of two parts. The first one is very simple. If the camera is located at coordinate x, y, z, we can refer to this coordinate as a vector and simply apply a translation by the inverse of that vector. So in the case of x, y, z, we will apply a translation by minus x, minus y, minus z. If we add minus x, minus y, minus z to x, y, z, we get the point 0, 0, 0 or the origin. After we apply this translation to all the vertices in our scene, we can see that all the objects have moved along the same vector together with the camera. So the distance between every two vertices remains exactly the same. But the camera is probably not looking along the positive uh, z-axis. If it happens to be looking at the right direction, then uh, we are done. But uh, let's assume that it doesn't, okay? And uh, if your game allows the, the camera to tilt from uh, side to side, then we need to make the near clip plane or the frustum parallel to the ground. In order to describe the camera, I like to use a camera model which is called a UVN camera. You can find additional resources uh, online about this model and there are other models, of course, but I like to use this uh, UVN camera because it is very simple. In this model, the camera is specified using two attributes. The first one is the camera location within the 3D world and we already saw how to use this location to move the camera back to the origin. The second attribute is a 3D coordinate system called UVN. This coordinate system specifies the orientation of the camera. Here we have three axes. The first one is the N axis. This is the direction that the camera is looking. So if you're looking uh, at your monitor or your phone right now, then uh, the vector that goes from, from your eye to the monitor, that's the N. The second axis is the V axis. That's the vector that points uh, upward. Uh, by default, the, that vector is the same as the Y axis in a standard coordinate system. If you do this, 
like that with your head, which is uh, called uh, pitching. You're basically moving the V axis along with the N. And the last axis is U. That axis points to the right from the camera, defined by the N and the V. So it corresponds to the X in the standard 3D coordinate system. The important thing here is that we have exactly 90 degrees between each uh, two axes in the UVN model. This means that they are orthogonal to each other, and in linear algebra we say that they are linearly independent. Another important property of the UVN axis is that we keep them uh, normalized. So we can change the orientation of the camera, but we make sure the length of, his, of each axis is always one. What we want to achieve in the second step of the view transformation is to basically align UVN with the XYZ of the world coordinate system. So uh, U will be parallel to the X, V will be parallel to the Y, and N will be parallel to the Z. This means that if we have a vertex with position XYZ in the world coordinate system, we want to get its position X tag, Y tag, Z tag in reference to the UVN coordinate system according to the current uh, orientation of the camera. This is the same as saying that we want to align UVN with the world coordinate system because as we turn the camera around to align UVN with the world, we are also moving all the objects along with the camera so they have uh, a new position in the world. This change of base coordinate system is what often confuses people, but I hope you shall see that it's not that difficult. Okay, from now on, I'm going to use a 2D system because it's much simpler for me to create uh, 2D diagrams than uh, 3D. Once you understand the 2D, then adding another axis is uh, really nothing. Let's remind ourselves what a position vector actually means. For example, we have a position 2 by 3. 2 is the x and uh, 3 is the y. 2 by 3 is actually a shorthand for saying that we multiply 2 by the x-axis, which is 1, 0, and we add that to 3 multiplied by the y-axis, which is 0, 1. The key point that we need to understand is that we have a primary coordinate system, that's the world, with axis uh, one, uh, 1, 0 and 0, 1 in our 2D example. We have a point in the world specified by world coordinates, and we have a secondary coordinate system for the camera, whose axes are specified as vectors in the world coordinate system. We're basically asking what are the coordinates of the point in reference to the secondary system. The trick in order to solve this problem is actually to do this in reverse. So we will start with a point that references the camera space. That point doesn't know anything about the world. Uh, it's very easy to devise a transformation that will take this point from the camera space to the world space, and once we do that, we just need to reverse the transformation to get the one that we actually need from, from world to, to camera. In the following diagram, we can see this setup. The origin of the two coordinate systems is the same, and the secondary coordinate system is rotated 45 degrees clockwise. The axis of the secondary system are uh, 1 by minus 1 for the x and 1 by 1 for the y. Using the Pythagorean theorem, we can calculate the length of these vectors as the square of 2. We must normalize these axes and we do that by dividing the components of each vector by its length. So 1 divided by the square of 2 is about 0 0.707. So the normalized axes for the secondary coordinate system are 0 0.707 by minus uh, 0 0.707 for the x and 0 0.707 by 0 0.707 for the y. These are of course uh, irrational numbers, so I won't go beyond uh, three digits after the point, but uh, you get what I mean. Now let's draw a point in reference to the secondary coordinate system at one by one. We can use the long head formula from before in order to transform this point to the primary coordinate system by multiplying each component with the corresponding axis vector, which is given in the primary coordinate system. So we get uh, one multiplied by uh, 0 0.707 by minus 0 0.707 plus 1 multiplied by 0 0.707 by 0 0.707. The result is 1.414 by 0. 1.414 is actually the square of 2. And again, you can use the Pythagorean theorem to see that this is correct. 
So the point one by one in the secondary coordinate system is actually the square of two by zero in the primary coordinate system. To summarize, if we have a position in coordinate system A, we can multiply each component by the corresponding axis using the coordinates of that axis in coordinate system B. We sum up all these products together and we get a position in coordinate system B. We can write this transformation in the following matrix form. The axis of the secondary system in reference to the primary system are specified in columns. When we multiply this matrix by a position vector, which is in reference to the secondary system, we get a position in the primary system. So now you're asking, how can we get the reverse transformation from primary to secondary? And the answer is simply to invert that matrix. Now, the inverse of a matrix is simply another matrix that when we multiply it by the original matrix, we get the identity uh, matrix. I don't want to go too deeply into a linear algebra here, but in our case, since the rows and columns of our transformation matrix are uh, orthonormal vectors, that is, they are linearly independent and the length of each vector is one, we can simply transpose the matrix to get its inverse. Remember, the two vectors are linearly independent when you cannot multiply one vector by some value and get the other one. Using this knowledge, let's write a 4x4 transformation matrix from camera space to world space based on the UVN vectors. We can now transpose the 3x3 submatrix where we have the UVN vectors in order to get the transformation from world to camera. This simply means uh, changing the rows to columns. Let's multiply this matrix by a standard translation matrix that is based on the location of the camera in the world, only in the negative, because we want to move the camera to the origin, and we get the following final matrix. And now let's implement this. Okay, so uh, as usual, this uh, code is directly based on the one from the previous uh, tutorial, the one on the perspective projection. So make sure to watch that. All the changes are in this function, render CNCB or uh, callback. First, I created uh, a world transformation by combining the rotation and the translation that we already had them in the previous uh, tutorial, but they were uh, combined uh, directly with the projection. So now I, now I have them uh, separated. So here we have the rotation exactly as before and translation. And first we apply the rotation. Okay, this is why it is on the right. And then on the left hand side, we have translation. We combine them both in order to create the world transformation uh, for the object. Next comes the camera. So first I defined a vector here for the camera position. You can see right now it is um, uh, on the origin, right? Zero, zero, zero. And we have the UVN vectors here. And you can see that uh, they're currently aligned with the, with the world, right? With the X, Y, Z uh, of the world. And we manually create the camera matrix here, as we saw uh, in the background section. So uh, we have the translation of the camera here in negative, and we have the UVN vectors here, and they go by rows, right? So we have the U, which is aligned with the X, and next the V, which is uh, aligned with, uh, with Y, and N, which is aligned with Z. And after that, we have the projection. So we don't have any change here. And finally, we create the uh, WVP uh, matrix here by first taking the world uh, transformation for the object, and then we multiply it by the camera, and, uh, and then we do the projection, okay? So if we run this like that with the camera at the origin and it is uh, looking down the uh, positive z-axis, we won't see any change, okay? So it is the same uh, cube as before. So let's take the uh, camera uh, one unit back on the z-axis and we can see that the, the cube looks uh, further away. So it's, it's the same as uh, moving uh, the cube uh, forward along the z-axis, right? So now let's pull it back even one more unit and we can see that uh, it is uh, as expected. It is further away. Now um, let's bring it back a bit and let's move the camera um, one unit to the right along the x-axis. 
and as the camera moves to the right we can see that the that the object goes to the left so they kind of compensate each other right when you turn your head to the right then the world seems to go to the left so this is the same here and if we move uh, the camera uh, one unit up on the z-axis now we can see uh, the top of the um, of the cube. If uh, we do this uh, in, in the negative, we will be able to see uh, the bottom of the bottom of the cube. Now, I don't want to play right now with the UVN because uh, we need to keep them uh, normalized and uh, linearly independent. So this is something that I want to leave for the next uh, for the next episode. So at this point, guys, I have to tell you that, that this code is a total mess. I mean, we've got all these matrices right here that are created and uh, manipulated inside our render uh, function, our main render loop. And uh, this is not even a real application, right? This is just some uh, rotating cube. And just, uh, just think what would happen in a real application with uh, multiple objects, uh, possibly several cameras, possibly even multiple uh, projection matrices for, for, for whatever reason, it would be a nightmare to maintain. So what we're gonna do in the next episode is to clean stuff a bit, refactor everything, uh, create a real camera class, and uh, move all the camera manipulation code over there, and uh, most importantly, allow the user to control the camera uh, using the keyboard and also take care of all the other transformation matrices here so that the main render function becomes uh, much simpler. Thank you for watching this episode about the camera space. If you did, please hit that like button for me and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching and uh, I will see you soon.